All right, guys, bang, bang. Uh, Lee is here, and we are going to talk about all kinds of awesome things. So thank you so much for uh, for doing this. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, for those that don't know you, maybe let's just start with your background and kind of uh, where you grew up and uh, what you did before you got into uh, journalism. Oh, wow. Well, I was very young before I got into journalism. Um, I grew up in Boston. I was born in Boston, and I grew up in a little town south on the south shore called Norwell. Um, and yeah, just a small town upbringing. And I probably wouldn't have really been very cultured or worldly or interested in intellectual things, except I was so focused on reading as a child. And for me, reading was an escape. You know, I was definitely that like quintessential child who like was really introverted. My mom always had to be like, go outside and play and talk to people. And I was always very you know, I just felt books were so much more interesting than people. And now I know that's not true, but it took me years to get out of my shell. And now I tell people I'm a fake extrovert. A lot of people think I'm a natural extrovert and I am not. Um, in fact, just doing this, not on the phone and on cameras, you know, just so not me. But, uh, you know, it, there was this opportunity to talk more deeply. So I thought, why not? Um, so I grew up, yeah, mostly just in love with books and reading and writing and, um, went to journalism school. And when I graduated, I went straight to New York. I was lucky enough to get to write for the wall street journal and for Dow Jones. And, um, but I really spent all of college, like with my eye on that. I didn't just, I didn't know anyone in journalism. I come from one of those windy Irish German families where everyone thinks they can write but almost all of them, including, you know, me when I started, was just horrible at it, you know? And so, you know, over time you get better. And I really like hit my stride in college. And then I was very lucky, you know, if you work at the Wall Street Journal or you're lucky enough to work in a place where there are these amazing pros, you get some of the best training in the world. And when I joined the newsroom, I was the only non-Ivy League person that I knew in my own newsroom. Almost everyone had lived in multiple countries, spoke multiple languages, you know. So I was very lucky to be coming into a place that was just where there was no way I wasn't going to benefit and learn. And uh, and that was sort of my early days at Wall Street, really, for the first 15 years of my career. And then as I wrote about corruption, as we led up to the financial crisis, I got much more interested in how corruption not just in finance, but in many places is very organic. You know, people don't get together and say, hey, let's be super corrupt. Like, let's lie and cheat and steal because we love it. You know, most people end up on a slippery slope where it happens and there's a community surrounding it that's either enabling it or at some point you're making so much money that you just keep going. Um, and I started to realize that corruption was really not appreciated and not really written about very well. And I really wanted to talk to people who were in those circles and find out more about how it all worked. Um, and so I got much more involved in talking at first to traders, but over time, every kind of person imaginable. Um, and really the key is to not be judgmental. You know, what you really want to hear is someone's real story. You know, you don't want, you want the real story and the best story and the deepest story. And so that has been sort of the, my guide throughout my career. Um, and then from the journal, I went on to write for a lot of other places, you know, Fortune, Forbes, Financial Times, um, and you saw my institutional investor story and called me. Absolutely. And so before we get into um, the, the fun stuff around crypto and some of the work that you're doing now, um, you wrote this book and uh, th this book on uh, kind of the world's oil market and uh, um, having a deep understanding of the oil market uh, was probably helpful earlier this year when uh, some of the futures contracts went negative. Uh, but maybe tell us a little bit just about where did the uh, the impetus for the first book come from um, and, uh, and especially the title, The Asylum, um, and kind of yeah. the, the thought process behind that and the work that you did to write that book. Yeah, well, when I was covering the oil market on Wall Street, this was obviously when we had the second big war in Iraq. You know, we saw oil prices going up. Uh, and then the New York Mercantile Exchange, which at the time wasn't mostly electronic, it was mostly open outcry with traders who were physically in New York, um, you know, in a very locked room all day long, arguing over prices and setting the global oil prices for not just not just oil, but gasoline, heating oil, propane and natural gas, which was always considered like the big table at the casino. That's where you 
had the biggest price swings and could often make the most money. Uh, and I started to get to know the traders. I started to get to know the market. And one day I was sitting with one of the former chairmen of the New York Mercantile Exchange. We were having lunch. And he said, I'm so glad that you're writing about us now. You, there used to be another journalist for the Wall Street Journal. He used to always cover us. And at the end of every story, he would always talk about how we defaulted on the potato market in 1976. And I was like, what do you mean, potato? <laughs> the oil market. And he said, no, no, first we were potatoes. And before that we were eggs, cheese and butter. And, you know, and I got much more interested in the history. I was still quite young. I was still like, you know, really in my mid twenties, you know, sitting there in my, you know, badly put together outfits and the rest of it. And, you know, listening to this old chairman telling me about potato default, um, which is a whole other story and so fascinating. But basically this was a market full of these very um, down at the heel, people, a lot of them immigrants um, who came to America and, and weren't getting jobs on Wall Street, but wanted to trade. And in many cases, ended up at the New York Mercantile Exchange trying to scrape something together. And for many years, they, they succeeded, but mostly failed until a man named Michael Marks um, conceived of an energy market and introduced the first energy contracts. Um, and he's still alive today. He's, he's in New Jersey, um, where he's retired. And enjoying the good life. But he um, he was also a wonderful source. And I just got very involved in the story of this exchange and also the, the shenanigans that would go on behind closed doors. You know, whenever I showed up at the exchange, they had a photo of me behind the desk. Um, and it didn't matter. And, you know, for a while I came with a natural dark wig and maybe I got in twice. But you know, I was not allowed on the trading floor. Like my name was everywhere behind the desk. It was like, sorry, we can't let you in because you're really a good man and you're going to want to talk to everyone. And so I, I ended up writing the book, you know, through the interviews with these traders. And it's really an oral history of the energy market going way back to early last century um, to the present day and just what happened, you know, and all the, you know, a lot of the greed really did take it over. But just like in Bitcoin and lots of other markets, the initial intention was quite pure. And so where did the name The Asylum come from? What, what was that uh, a, uh, a line to? Sorry, I forgot that part. Um, the Asylum was, uh, the traders used to joke about how they were the inmates and that this was the asylum. And there's a, I think in the early part of the book, but you should see it in the first couple chapters, it, the quote, you know, where they talk about themselves as inmates. Um, and how it, how they called it the asylum. So the first time I went down there, they, they said, welcome to the asylum. And I, that just stuck with me. But it really was an asylum for them. You know, a lot of them didn't fit in anywhere else. Yeah, that's an awesome story. Um, and, and then from there, uh, you end up writing um, one of the early pieces uh, on Bitcoin, like you mentioned. Um, and uh, at this point, you're at Newsweek. Tell us a little bit about uh, that story and, and kind of the search for Satoshi. Yeah, so when Newsweek relaunched, um, and I was, I was, I think, one of the first writers they hired, and uh, I just, I grew up reading Newsweek and loved it, so I was extremely game to help with the relaunch. Um, we had already been writing a lot of articles online, but this was the big relaunch in print, and one of my editors, I've never told this story, but one of my editors sent me an email. He was a playful British guy, um, still a wonderful dear friend and one of my favorite editors. He was a real hard ass. You know, he, he, he didn't give you an inch, but once you proved yourself, he, you know, he was great. And he sent me a note and said, I've been looking at this Bitcoin. And this was around 2013. He sent me a note. He said, I've been looking at this Bitcoin and, um, would you look into these Bitcoin women? And I wrote back and said, Bitcoin women? And he wrote, well, I don't know, but that Bitcoin is trouble. And wherever there's trouble, there's women. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a lot of sexist jokes in the newsroom. It's just part of the life. Um, so I said, oh yeah, let me go check it out. But I, the more I looked at it, the more I realized this is phenomenal. And, and how would somebody even begin to create a code that could, could, could act as currency and somehow get the rest of the world to actually exchange cash for it. Um, you know, imagine yourself going into a room with your smartest friends and saying, hey, how about y'all give me some cash for this code that I'm writing? You know, they'd laugh you out of the room, um, even if you were brilliant, 
right? So my big question was, how did it really get off the ground? Who was behind it? Um, th there seemed to be some people who knew more things than others. And it was not um, it was not a bad thing that Gavin Andreessen, who was the chief scientist at the time, uh, he lived just a couple towns over from my home in Vermont. So it was easy to pop over there and just try to get a lay of the land from him to start with. And, and really, I just wanted to talk to you. It was early days. It was. It still hadn't exploded yet, and you could still go and talk to like the top ten people who had emailed with Satoshi, right? You know, who had talked to him a lot and had very strong opinions on who this person was. And my first thought was, let's create a profile based on what all these people say and agree on, and then take it from there um, to see what we can find in the world that fits what they directly experienced. Yeah, and and I think that you know still. To this day, people ask the question, you know, who is it, right? And, and uh, there's some people who believe it's better off that nobody knows, and there's other people who believe, you know, it would be awesome to, to figure it out. Um, and, yeah. uh, and and in yeah. this in the story, um, obviously Dorian uh, Nakamoto, who uh, I've uh, I've met and uh, we, we've hung out at a uh, at a conference, um, and couldn't be a sweeter guy, um, is uh, is now become kind of a. Uh, I don't want to say a staple of the crypto, crypto community, but but he is definitely uh, present um, quite often, which is uh, which is cool to see him uh, kind of attending events and things like that as well. So what did Dorian say to you when you talked to him? I'm interested. Uh, I'm not trying to interview you, but yeah. so, so I actually don't remember kind of the initial conversation. It's one of these things where like you you don't remember exactly what people say. You just remember kind of how you felt um, in, yeah. in the initial moments. And uh, when we saw each other, we both kind of like lit up. And, uh, and went over to each other, we were talking. Um, and, uh, I think he was probably just as surprised that I recognized him as I was that he recognized me. And so it was kind of this weird, you know, like, Oh, okay. Um, and, uh, it was in LA at a, uh, at the Bitcoin 2020 conference and, uh, or I'm sorry, San Francisco. Uh, and, uh, and we were hanging out and he just was like, happy to be there. And like, you could tell he was excited about, kind of all of the energy and everything that was going on, right? And, and people were coming up to him and talking to him and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I, I just, I think that was like my biggest takeaway was just happy. Like he was very happy as a person, um, which, uh, you know, is somewhat rare in today's world. So when you see somebody like that, I think uh, you kind of remember it. Yeah. He, I mean, he's an incredibly, I mean, his whole family who I interviewed, very, very brilliant guy. And um He's not some old guy. <laughs> He's not a random old guy. He's very brrilliant and he um, you know he he's you know he's into it obviously he's you know he's quite enthusiastic even today um, and you know I think that uh, even though I haven't been able to talk to him directly, you know obviously in the in the aftermath of the story, it was clear he, you know, we wanted to do a follow-up interview so we could also square what he had said to us with what he was saying later mm -hmm. and not to get ahead of ourselves, but, um, but I really, really wanted to be able to connect with him, but it was clear that that wasn't something he would want to do. And, you know, you can't force situations, journalists, you can just show up and keep trying. You have to walk away if they say no, but I just felt like considering what everyone had been through in 2014 with that story, it just seemed um, better to wait or, you know, to really to wait or at, at least for the moment to let things go and let him settle after everything. Uh, I definitely didn't expect the level <laughs> that that went to on the day it was published. Well, well and so, um, you know, I, for everyone listening, uh, Lee and I talked before and like, th this is all stuff, I think, very sensitive because there's just so many people involved in the story and, and everyone's got kind of their own perspectives and, and opinions. So uh, maybe from your perspective, because uh, it's impossible for you to kind of talk to other people's perspective, um, just kind of talk a little bit about like, the quote unquote aftermath, right? So you publish this story, uh, it, it's a cover story. Um, and then, you know, all hell breaks loose, basically good and, uh, you know, maybe not so good, but kind of what was your perspective and kind of how do you view it today? I think, and I should talk a little bit about the lead up because that was important as well. Um, you know, lead up and aftermath. In the lead up, we were really just looking to get the best profile possible and then look at every single candidate. Um, 
several things that the people I interviewed told me, you know, including Gavin, but a lot of others who had corresponded with Satoshi and worked on the code, had said things like, you know, gave timelines, things like uh, the, the code took about two years to write, according to Satoshi, you know, there were consistent messages that came from everyone. And you could look at someone's resume and see, you know, I remember Nick Zavo was a very prominent candidate for a lot of people. And, um, but he clearly wasn't free to do what it was that those who spoke with Satoshi said had to be done to create the code. Uh, his, his itinerary did not match at all, like a very busy person and didn't match this whole like spending two years very quietly working on this thing. Um, and Gavin and the others had said it was really clear that the code might have been supplemented by some people, but was really clearly coming mainly from one individual. Um, and so a lot of the early pieces of information and then certain things like I don't know if you guys all know this, but there was a, you know, there was a crashed file when they were test driving uh, Bitcoin before the official launch and they were just trying to get it going. There was a crash file with Hal Finney um, that had, um, at one point Satoshi had written to Hal and said, send me, send me the data so I can figure out what went wrong. And he was supposed to send it privately to Satoshi, but instead Hal posted it publicly on a forum so everyone could look at it. And that had an IP address in it that led us to the same neighborhood Dorian lives in in LA. And so there were certain like hard pieces of evidence that led us repeatedly to Dorian, but it wasn't um, it wasn't something where one could say before interviewing him, oh, well, that's open and shut. We don't even need to talk to him. Like, of course I had to go talk to him. Um, and there were weeks of us exchanging emails. And I even sent him a letter with a bit card in it like that Gavin had given me. Um, and so like when I did interview him, he he had already received all this and knew that what we were talking about was Bitcoin. So I think one of the things that was most disappointing to me was in the aftermath of saying, like he didn't know that that's what we were talking about. He definitely knew that we were talking about it. Um, we had been talking about it for weeks before I actually physically visited him. Um, but he really didn't want to talk about it. You know, he really didn't want to discuss it. And I suspect if there hadn't been two other people there kind of pressuring him to talk when I was doing the interview in person, um, that he may not have said anything. Um, but by the time the story was published, we had interviewed the whole family. We had interviewed a lot of people surrounding him. We'd interviewed him. Um, and we'd also double and triple checked that interview uh, and talked to his brothers. And, you know, so by the time it came out, I, I couldn't have checked anything more deeply than I had. I, I pretty much obsessively checked everything. Um, that being said, I expected a reaction because as you noted, lots of people don't want to know who it is. Um, they consider it inappropriate. Um, there's all those reasons. So you, you're only even going to be interested in this if you already want to know. If you don't want to know, you're not even going to be interested in this story. Um, when it was published, I was ready for a lot of screaming over, we shouldn't talk about who this is. What I was not ready for was people saying that a concrete interview with witnesses never really happened or didn't really happen the way that was reported. Um, when you've worked for 20 years in interviews and no one's ever said anything like that before, you, you know, it really takes you by surprise. So that day, the storming of Dorian's lawn and the people camping out and, you know, just the haranguing and, uh, you know, that was horrible to watch as a journalist. It's the opposite of what you want. Um, you do not want to see that happen. And I mean, I have very wealthy hedge fund managers who are scared when just one person comes to their house and protests with a sign, you know, like somebody was telling me the other day, Daniel Loeb had someone outside screaming about inequality. And he was like, oh, it's so upsetting. They're coming to our houses. And, and uh, I, I, you know, I can't imagine what that was like for him. It was certainly uh, horrible to watch for me. So I can only imagine what it was like for him to experience. And then, of course, everyone's outraged about that. So, you know, it was almost like this cascading set of events that were in motion that none of us could stop at that point.
Yeah. And I think one of the things that um, is so interesting as I've talked to you about kind of uh, the story and the process and, and then obviously the, uh, the kind of aftermath is uh, I don't think a lot of people understand the work that you did uh, before the article was actually published, right? So in terms of talking to the family and, and like you said, kind of double and triple checking. Um, and then on top of that, obviously, there's people at Newsweek who are looking at this. Um, when you kind of look back at that process, um, you know, what, what do you remember kind of the, the family's reactions or, or family and friends as you were talking about before the story came out? Was this something that was like, a, oh, yeah, of course, you know, that's possible? Or was were people kind of completely oblivious and didn't even understand, you know, kind of Bitcoin or anything about it? So Jorian and his, Jorian's the oldest of three brothers. Um, and he, he changed his name from Satoshi Nakamoto to Dorian Prentice. Um, during Prentice Satoshi Nakamoto in 1973 when he became a naturalized citizen. And he and his brothers are all, all very bright. Um, his brother, Arthur, they both work for Hughes Aircraft doing classified work. Um, there was quite a background. His brother had a pipe bomb planted in his car and, and obviously very terrifying when he worked for Hughes. And as a result, you know, the family felt really uneasy about any sort of public stuff, especially after, uh, you know, what happened when Arthur had that happen to him was, you know, a pretty big, you know, probe into, well, did he do it? Did someone else do it? I guess it was in the professional parking garage where he was working. So there was already this feeling of, we don't really want to expose ourselves to things. Um, this, this horrible thing had happened. And, and um, I remember Dorian's former wife telling me that it was just really devastating and scary. And, you know, who would want to put a bomb, you know, in his car? And um, I think they were very surprised when people tried to look into him, like he might've put it there himself. It was upsetting to say the least. And so, you know, there was kind of a family feeling of not wanting to expose themselves anyway to any kinds of deeper inquiries, but Dorian himself was very private. You know, when he first started emailing me back, his emails didn't have his name on it. His email said Mountain Spring. That was it. That was his name. And, um, and I thought for a guy who is, you know, of a certain age, um, a programmer, but someone who's also been a teacher and has done a lot of other things. Um, I just didn't, I didn't expect that. I, I might expect that from like some, a millennial, but Mountain Spring from a senior citizen was quite surprising. So he, you know, his family had talked about him as very private, um, that he was always working on things but didn't really share, um, and that they did think that he he could have been involved, but that he wouldn't confirm it. Um, they all did talk to him uh, to to this day family members have come to me saying that they think that he did, but, or, you know, that he was certainly working on it, but that they can't get him to open up about it. So it's really one of those strange family things. You know, I don't know if you've ever talked to families at length, especially in my case as a journalist, you end up hearing about all the things, you know, and then you're like, okay, almost none of this is reportable and it's not relevant, but I do want to give a fair understanding of who this person is and what they're like. And um, he, I think the person you see at the conferences is a very different kind of person than person, you know, that they experience. Um, but that doesn't mean those two people aren't real, right? A lot of us, we're all complex and, and hopefully somewhat integrated. So that was their response. Um, it was kind of painful too for some of them. Um, before the story came out, I had to contact everyone to close down their Facebook accounts or to remove anything that was going to be publicly not stuff that they would want to share with the world. You know, there were a couple things one of the kids had put on his Facebook page that I thought might make him feel vulnerable if everybody was reading it the next day. So we talked about that. And there was a whole process of let's clear out anything that's going to make you feel harmed. Um, and so there was a preparation before the story was released. And you know, you do what you can as a journalist, you, you know, we also didn't want to affect the Bitcoin price. You know, you have to try to create the most neutral footprint you can. And that was important. I, in fact, when I reread the story, I'm some, somewhat surprised these days of how kind of simple it is. 
you know, like there was so much detail we didn't put in because Bitcoin was such a weird thing to even explain to people. So we're just trying to make it as easy to understand as possible. The problems that arose with the story and the protests were so different than what I had anticipated, you know, um, questions about certain parts of the interviews. And if I'd known, right, I probably would have written it very differently. It's so fascinating too, because uh, it sounds like you were, um, you know, had done the work and, and you were very uh, cognizant of the fact that like, look, there could be, you know, so, some, uh, some interest in this and um, spending a lot of time with the family. Yeah. I don't know how many journalists think that they're going to basically get scrutinized by, you know, millions of people on the internet for their interviews and the way that they wrote their story. And, and like, let's say, I, I think uh, not exactly the thing that uh, most journalists go through on a daily basis. Um, and when you say aftermath, uh, you know, that, that's a pretty good, I think, uh, description of, uh, of the reaction from, uh, from the crowd, if you will. Yeah. And there was like a hunt, like one of my former colleagues from the journal called me and said, you didn't really talk talk to this guy at this classified government. There was a classified government um, contract, a company that Dorian had worked for. And he said, well, I talked to the man that you quoted and he says he has no recollection of the conversation. And I said, well, you know, okay, I guess we're like going to look at every single detail, but I can tell you the day we spoke, I can show you the phone records. Like, I'm happy to do that. I mean, if you're really going to say that, maybe it wasn't true, then of course I'm happy to share all that. But I told him, I'm being honest with you, you're barking up a very useless tree. Um, I know that there's like a protest going on, but everything here was checked like 8,000 ways till Friday. So, you know, if somebody wants to see something, I'm happy to show it to them. Um, and, and the journalist was like, oh, okay, all right, you know, my bad, and kind of backed off. But a lot of journalists wrote stories and never called me, you know, use my name and, you know, but never just part of being a journalist, you have to talk to everybody or try to talk to everybody who you're talking about your story. So I felt like there was a lot of that, but I think these days, none of that surprises us, right? We've all seen a lot of that lately. And I think for me, in terms of the reaction, the status part is when you deal with a complex topic, what you're trying to do is take chaos and impose some semblance of order, you know, take what is a lot of mythology and, and replace it with facts. And I think, sadly, a lot of these stories end up adding to the mythology in the end because the debate ends up going on and on and on and doesn't really end. And so that feeling of, I want to break through all this mythology with concrete facts, you know, it was, high, it was repelled so hard that, you know, you're like, even if I can prove these things, it sounds like no one wants to know or no one wants to hear it. So that's a different kind of story. And it's a much more intimidating kind of story when you want to bring back, but there are people who don't want to know those facts. Yeah. And, and before we move on from this topic, what's kind of yeah. your take now on um, Satoshi uh, and the importance, I guess, of finding out who is Satoshi for Bitcoin um, and, and kind of the Bitcoin community. Like, do you think that is important? And then any thoughts in terms of Dorian, somebody else, no yeah. clue? Like, like, kind of how do you just think about Satoshi in general now? So I think it is important. I think it's still important to know, especially as we're moving more and more toward a digital economy. Um, I actually think this story is important because you know, as you were saying, there's excitement at some of these conferences and there's, you know, it is exciting as we move toward a digital economy and the key players that are bringing us there are important, whether they want to be in the open or not. Um, I, I would even encourage anyone who wants to stay completely anonymous, but they still want their theories, methodology, narratives, and, um, you know, way of looking at the world known. I would still think that would be worth publishing. Um, because it's shaping the world around us right now. And as for, you know, we talked a little bit, you know, off the record about the aftermath. Um, Homeland Security investigated, opened an investigation as my story was coming out. Um, I, of course, got lots of email, but I got email from one group in particular that had real information to share. And I do hope to write a follow-up story um, that provides a lot more information surrounding you know, what I reported initially, but there is so much more and it isn't, you know, it isn't specific to just Dorian. And I think we all knew that, you know, we all, 
it was not satisfying to just focus on Dorian, there is definitely more. And I hope very much to be able to share that. I also feel like I want to respect the, the privacy and feelings of some of the people who have talked to me. So, you know, I hope to be able to do that. And because I'm a journalist, I'm going to keep trying to do that. Um, I feel I have a duty, especially after the first story, to do it. Yeah. And, and then you've got a very unique perspective because um, going through all of the work and conversations that you did for that Newsweek story and then kind of living through um, the aftermath of it and the scrutiny. Uh, and then, uh, you know, when we connected, it was because you had recently wrote a piece in Institutional Investor about kind of crypto yeah. on Wall Street. And so, yeah. you know, two very different types of stories, same assets, right? In terms of uh, tracking down Satoshi Nakamoto and then talking now about kind of Wall Street hedge funds um, becoming very interested in this. So maybe tell us a little bit about the institutional investor story and, and kind of what you found there as you looked at uh, crypto on Wall Street. Yeah, and you know, it's all related because you have, when I look at this broadly, you have the finance piece, obviously. You have the government piece, you know, whether it's regulation or the intelligence side of things. Um, and then you have the people using it, right? The consumers or the, um, the the people who are really into Bitcoin and want to be completely unbanked, you know, that sort of thing. So you have sort of these three, I, I look at it as these three big pieces, which is kind of like the Bitcoin fans, the, you know, straight lace Wall Street people or the digital finance, you know, wonks who are working on the infrastructure. And then this kind of regulatory intelligence government piece. And, you know, they all really do come together. And for people who want to know, you know, is there a piece of U.S. intelligence in this? Yes, there is. <laughs> yes, there is. And there's not, it's not, um, it's not a mystery that that would be the case based on the technology that created Bitcoin. A lot of it harks to things that were being used by our intelligence communities. So, um, you know, how that turned into an invention and then that turned into Wall Street seeing possibilities and then the government saying, oh God, we're clearly moving toward a digital economy and we need to figure out how to get around this. You know, not around it, but get our, get our hands around it so we can figure out how to regulate it have some law-based sense of what's going on. Um, and so this story really delves into like those different pressure points, you know, how Wall Street's getting much more excited, uh, especially with the dollar not looking so great these days. <laughs> you know, there are not that many places to flee the system. You know, the system is pretty big now, and, and but you have Bitcoin and it's a way to flee the system. Um, it was one that was seen as fringe for so long, but now you have these very heavy duty big players on Wall Street who are saying, I need to flee the dollar <laughs> and, and anything denominated in it that might hurt me or anything that might be affected by this pandemic um, and actually, you know, devalue my investments. You know, and Bitcoin is a very, very good place to go for some of those people. Um, but you also have the regulators in Washington. I talked to many lawyers who and, and people on the regulatory side who are still very down on Bitcoin. Um, one very bright lawyer, very, very experienced, who works with um, the SEC said to me, he said, well, all they're doing is swapping it for something else. So, so what? There's no inherent thing. You know, it's not like a barrel of oil. It's not like a piece of paper that represents a barrel of oil. It's just a store of value that you can swap for another store of value and that's all. And I mean, that's a very simplistic way of looking at it, as we know. Um, but there's still a real disconnect. And so this story was really talking about the genuine disconnect between well-meaning people who want to see a great digital economy, um, but are afraid about what will change do, what, will, what kind of risk will come with the change. And at the same time, as you know, we have Venezuela, China, and Iran who love the idea of being at the forefront of a digital economy with copycat coins that allow them to go completely outside the U.S. banking system. We've been controlling a lot of these countries and, and using um, our dollar to attack opponents when diplomacy or, or actual war doesn't work. Well, we can hit their bank accounts because so much is denominated, at least in, in part, in the U.S. dollar. So when you talk about asymmetrical warfare, the Treasury Department can quickly come after people just through their money, and that can be very effective. Um, so if we're going to change money, that changes our national security as well. 
Yeah, and I think what's um, you know kind of eye opening about this is that when you look at those other countries, like the game theory here is like one of the number of questions I always get from people who are first learning about it is they say something to the effect of, um, well, why can't the government just ban it, or why won't the government ban it? And and I actually think that part of it is uh, there are a lot of other countries out there that want to um, see the U.S. dollar system. Uh, maybe not fall, but just they don't want to be on it, right? And so if all of a sudden there's a decentralized digital currency that they know the U.S. is you know, bearish on or, or banning ownership of for, for citizens, I actually think like that might serve as a magnet for them to all go adopt it, right? And, and yeah. kind of move to that system. And so the game theory almost prevents governments from stepping in and banning it. Is, is that kind of your take given the, the, um, the kind of work that you've done? So you, you probably saw in my article where Jamie Dimon um, of J.P. Morgan had said, you know, they'll ban it. They're not going to tolerate an alternative currency for, for long. Again, naive, because as soon as there is one and it's thriving, it's a great haven, not just for investors trying to flee the dollar, but criminals and money launderers and terrorists trying to flee the dollar so that they can that they can do attacks without needing to rely on the dollar or anything related to the U.S. banking system. So, of course, if the U.S. could have just banned it and stuck their head in the sand, I think, you know, any of us who weren't born yesterday, of course, they probably would have tried to do so, but they can't do so when everyone else is now adapting it or moving toward it. The only choice is to be at the forefront of it, which is part of the arguing that's going on now in Washington is how do we not fall behind, but how do we not undermine our own currency? Does this hurt our sovereignty? Does it hurt our national security? Do we understand the risk? But we also, if we, if we, if we take too long, someone else will develop a giant financial system around us and be participating in it. And we'll, we'll, we won't even be in that position to lead it. Um, so, you know, it is a threat, but it's not a threat we can't deal with. You know, we're, we're, we are hopefully, um, all evidence to the contrary lately, uh, are hopefully going to try to stay at the forefront of other countries in the world when it comes to our banking system. You know, our banking system is needing a disruption. We know this. Um, it's probably more overdue than any other sector. And I've heard people saying this now for well over a decade. So it's time. Yeah. And it feels like uh, the adoption by Wall Street specifically, not only one uh, further cements kind of Bitcoin's place and, and cryptocurrency's place in the global system, um, but two is uh, you see more and more folks. So whether it's Paul Tudor Jones, even you know the JP Morgans uh, now kind of coming in and realizing, hey, we have to do something here. It really does feel like we're at a point where uh, it's no longer the taboo subject of Wall Street. It's now okay, yeah. what are we going to do about it? And it feels like that was kind of one of the main takeaways I got when I read the article that you wrote was just like, this is here and they know that now. It's here and it's not going to go away. And, you know, we, we honestly, our intelligence community already knows that and has known it for some time. Um, that's why I kind of wrote a little bit about that in the story about, you know, the the working assumption is that we will be fully moved to a digital economy by 2040, you know, and I think that might even be, I mean, it sounds like aggressive, but it probably isn't very aggressive when you really think about it. So um, they're already putting pieces in place quietly to try to make sure that they're ahead of the game. Um, and at the same time, Wall Street's caught on. So I, I think the cat is too much out of the bag now. You know, somebody might hear this interview and say, oh, she's such a Bitcoin fan. I'm just being practical. Um, I am an economics fan, <laughs> but I just think that at this point, it's clear where we're going. And um, there are people who are going to sort of not feel comfortable. I think that I think it's much fairer to say I don't feel comfortable if you're someone who's still skeptical, because there is certainly all sorts of risks we've already addressed. So um, those are real. It's okay to not be comfortable, but that doesn't mean we can bury our head in the sand. We're probably going to have to figure it out. And, yeah. and Wall Street, Wall Street knows that too. And, and I think one of the things that is um, is really uh, when you unpack a critic's um, kind of uh, argument. There's the like what I'll call the the really surface level uh, things like you know money's a belief system nobody believes in this or there's no commodity backing you know all those types of things that are pretty easy at this point to disprove and 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 uh, I think the Bitcoin community and, and even people on Wall Street now have kind of moved past those types of arguments and what you get to at the heart of it is 
there is a subset of the population who just believes there's no way this can happen, right? And, and they can't articulate why or how, but it's just the belief that like, no way. And I, and it took me a while to get to this point or to understand that. But once I it like got in my head, I was like, these people have lived their entire life in one you know paradigm of the world and they don't think that there could be a transition to another. And so like, that's actually like a fair belief. I don't believe it's accurate, but like, I now understand why there's such like a mental block, I think, for some people to kind of change their mind or, or, or get over that hump. Because it's yeah. not a, a logical, you're, like, you're not going to walk in and have a logical argument and all of a sudden then be like, oh, of course, this makes a ton of sense, right? Instead, what you're going to get is you're going to get uh, people who just eventually have to realize like, yes, transition is possible, right? Yeah, I mean, it's true. There's no reason to think this is going to be an easy transition. Our infrastructure, our laws, everything isn't really set up for this. You know, that's why you saw, you know, the SEC repeatedly saying, like, we're not going to rewrite our rules for this. You know, we're, our rules don't really match what's going on here. And, you know, it was not created to match SEC rules. It wasn't created to fit in with existing infrastructures. That wasn't the point. Uh, the point was, in fact, to move away from them. Um, and I, I think the SEC can keep arguing it's not going to change the rules to fit it, but I think they're going to be forced to eventually um, because it's where we're headed. You know, the momentum is really behind this. And, and it's not necessarily only Bitcoin, as we all know, you know, many other ways to, to participate in the digital economy. Yeah. Um, and, and before we move on from a kind of Bitcoin and crypto, like what, what are the things that don't make it into that story, right? In terms of as you have conversations on Wall Street, like what were <laughs> your like takeaways in terms of how many of these hedge fund managers and, and other players on Wall Street are kind of thinking about all of this? Yeah. So there was so much in this story. We had to cut it down like several times. Um, I mean, there was a lot. My editor was like, was like, there's just too much stuff in here. <laughs> um, and I always want to say so much more than I can. So it, it, it's, it, you know, I got to tell you, I know that nobody is going to cry for a journalist, especially with the enemy of the people and all that going on right now. But like, it really is hard when you have like an embarrassment of riches that you just want to like let somebody download. I mean, I'm looking forward to that day where we all have chips in us and I can just like download stuff to somebody else. That would be really great. Um, but right now, you know, you just have to fit it into some kind of coherent story. Um, and thanks for asking about like what ended up on the cutting room floor because quite a bit. Um, I really found interesting talking to people who are trading offshore on these exchanges that nobody really knows <laughs> or understands. And I thought it was sort of important to include um, something about that. And I may write about it some more. But the, the few things that I loved were some of the weird offshore things that people have to explore the hard way, right? Like the same way you explore a new land, you just have to jump in and <laughs> see what happens. Um, one of the people I talked to said that as their firm was trading in these different markets, that they would try to contact whatever this exchange was, you know, whether it was in like Malta or Gibraltar or, you know, I think there was one place that had like, Oh, like over a dozen, like very highly trafficked exchanges, um, Slovenia, I think. Um, and, you know, if you Google Bitcoin in Slovenia, <laughs> you're like, oh, wow, it's like all Bitcoin, <laughs> you know? Um, they, they basically said they would try to find out if they could find a real person with a real name uh, behind any exchange you were going to trade on. And so the risk management side and the compliance side is really tricky. And, um, one person said to me, we don't even care. What we do is we just, we do it the way you, you first tried PayPal or we do it the way you, you buy something on eBay that's used and you don't really know what you're going to get. We just like try it once. If it goes okay, we do it again, you know, and we build trust from there. Um, so I love the concept of like this kind of like, you know, explorer of digital currencies trying to figure out like what things work for you. You know, one, one trader we really respect, um, Danny Masters, I don't know if you know him, but Danny Masters was, was saying, um, I believe he was the one who said some of the weirder exchanges are where you can make the most money. <laughs> and I don't know if that's true because one of the rules of journalism is you don't, you don't, uh, have, you can't invest in something you're writing about because that's, then you're not an objective person anymore. So I can't go buy a ton of Bitcoin. I've, I've obviously bought it to see how it works, but 
Um, as I told you, I've only ever owned five pounds sterling in my life of Bitcoin. <laughs> Um, because you have to stay outside of the topic you're writing about. But he was telling me that some of these exchanges are phenomenal. Um, I also found the products being created and some of the innovation. I really feel like I need to do like a top 20 every year of like top 20 innovations globally in this in this area because they're so cool. And they're much more uh, nuanced often than what you're going to find in an ordinary U.S. standardized market. Um, and so I would love to start doing something like, maybe you and I should talk about that, but um, I would love to do like a top 20 innovations in this area a year, you know, so people, because we can't stay on top of them all. There are just so many. You need someone to look at them all and kind of curate it for you. So those are the things that yeah. didn't and, make it. And, and what's interesting too is, um, so you take a Danny Masters, right? You take some of these folks that you interviewed and, and uh, these people are no slouches when it comes to understanding financial infrastructure, to understanding trading, to understanding markets and assets. Mm -hmm. Like they are some of the best and, and most experienced and, and most successful uh, in the traditional markets. And so when they yeah. come in and they say something like, oh, some of these exchanges are pretty good, you know, pretty good uh, in their eyes is actually usually really good in the eyes of kind of the average person, right? Which I think is always fascinating that, um, you know, th they're making a comparison usually not to kind of the bottom of the bucket of, of crypto infrastructure. They're actually usually yeah. comparing it to like the, the things that they're used to using in the traditional world, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Danny came from JP Morgan, was head of energy trading. Um, uh, he, he was somebody actually who was very helpful in my first book about the oil market. Um, I've known him since I was in my early 20s, which is amazing. I'm 44 now. Um, and yeah, he, I mean, he's kind of seen it all. Um, the nice thing about somebody like Danny is he doesn't get hysterical, but I mean, he is British. So, you know, there's that, that kind of groundedness that he brings to things, but he doesn't get hysterical about anything very easily. And so you have to sit up and listen when Danny says something, because he will often you know, come out and, and say, I've looked at this and this is what I think. And it's definitely worth considering. You know, he's, he's a source I, I definitely have frequently talked to when you're screaming from all corners and then you need to talk to somebody who's like the adult in the room. Danny's really good at that. <laughs> um, and we do need adults in the room. We, I, I do love this sort of super exuberance in so many parts of this market, but we really do need those sort of like you know, Danny's not a bean counter, but we do need the bean counters and we do need the the people who are really going to be skeptical and come in and roll up their sleeves and figure out how to make this work. You know, I know that a lot of people don't think it should ever be merged with our financial system, but I think it's clear it's going to need to be and it's going to be. Um, hopefully we can keep the spirit of it, you know, where it needs to be, where it's more inclusive and egalitarian. Uh, you you talk to me a lot about wealth. Um, we're talking about wealth equality and the wealth gap and in the beginning of the interview. And, you know, if I can speak to those who have come from an insider perspective about Bitcoin and the genesis of Bitcoin, it's very much about egalitarianism and not about being popular, not about being sexy, but about a more equal world for all. And I hope that it doesn't get moved into something that's, that's, that doesn't em embrace that. Yeah, and I think that this was um, one of the uh, inflection points for me mentally when I started to really uh, think more critically and understand. Uh, I'm trying to get out of the sun. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Do you, you want to close it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I'll just close the thing. curtain. <laughs> no, no, you're Here we fine. go. Uh, um, I keep, like, so, moving all the way over. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're perfectly fine. Okay. If you want to close it more, go ahead. You're all good? I think, I think we're good. Good. Okay, yeah. perfect. And then we can just edit that part out. Um, so the, the inflection point for me mentally was around this idea of uh, inflation is one of the greatest causes of wealth inequality. And the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. And a perfect example is what we've seen through this global pandemic where you know basically billionaires in the United States have made half a trillion dollars and 50 plus million people lost their jobs. And again, I don't think that's actually the billionaire's fault, nor do I think it's the average citizen's fault, right? It's a uh, a feature of the system and, and not a bug of the system, right? And, and so part of, I think, this uh, egalitarianism or, um, or, or this view of Bitcoin is if you can actually return back to sound money, 
you can drive a much more equitable world, right? You can get back to a, uh, maybe not a full um, kind of collapse of that wealth inequality gap, but at least a much smaller one. And when people hear that, I think that's like a, whoa, and they understand it, it, it starts to have a much bigger meaning than just what's the US dollar value of this asset. Right. And, and mm-hmm. it sounds like yeah. you spent a lot of time kind of thinking about wealth inequality. So maybe just kind of give us your overview of the wealth inequality landscape. Uh, people probably don't know this, but you were actually nominated for an award that you, on, on some of the work you did around wealth inequality. So I feel like you've got way more information than anyone else who's come on this uh, podcast can, uh, can share. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know we were going to be talking about this, but I'm glad we are. Um, yeah, I was I was part of a group of stories that were nominated for the National Magazine Award, um, and it was on wealth inequality. Uh, I just felt I was so tired of hearing about how unequal everything is. We know it's unequal. So my question was, you know, I said to my editor, I want to find the most equal place. <laughs> like, where is the most equal place in the country? Um, because we were doing all these roundups of the least equal places, right? And it wasn't necessarily very, you know, okay, what are you going to do with that? You know? So I, um, I, I decided to just look at all the big, you know, cities, big and small across the country. There's a measurement called the Gini coefficient, which basically looks at the disparity between the wealthiest and the poorest in every community. And I found a place called Ogden, Utah, which is still a town I'm extremely fond of, you know, and I was researching it from uh, from over here on the East Coast, and I went online, and it just looked like a phenomenal town. But of course, my big question was, was if I fly there, is it going to look as good? And also, are they just all equally poor? <laughs> Which is, you know, we wanted the most equal, but we also wanted the most like doing well and equal. So, you know, it can't be all equally rich or all equally poor, because that's not really the point. The point is like, who has a thriving middle class? with a really reasonable Gini coefficient. And so I flew out there and it turned out, I mean, it couldn't have been better. Um, I was lucky. I probably should have found like a weird community that just uh, happens to have, you know, this part working for it. Um, it turned out that this town had been really doing badly for a decade prior and had fell into squabbling over what to do as they declined, you know, when people moved out. And one day somebody told me, one day the anchor store at the mall pulled out. And then within no time, everyone pulled out of that mall. And think of one of these giant strip malls in the center of your town. They said the entire thing closed down and was just filled with homeless people within like not too long and became this horrible, dangerous eyesore. And, you know, that was when the town was like, oh no, what are we going to do? You know, what's going to happen to us? Um, And they got together and started doing all these amazing projects. And they did the right thing um, by not just the community, but they started seeding small businesses, um, which I found fascinating because a lot of small businesses have to really scrape for money. Ogden was seeding something between like eight and 12 small businesses every year with just, here's some cash, go for it. Um, They did do screening, but they really just were trying to create jobs and business again and some level of prosperity. And if you look at the statistics, it's small businesses that create the most jobs in the United States, right? So if you're not seeding small businesses, you're not seeding jobs. And this um, economic development office in the town, I I talked to them at length and they they told me after years of seeding these businesses and and slowly the town came back. And by the time I got there, it was doing great. Um, The head of economic development, when we were driving through the town, he was showing me all the businesses. um, I said, by now you probably have a feeling for who's going to succeed and fail, right? And he goes, no idea. No idea. Uh, He said one of the most popular places, um, it's a pizza place, but now it's huge, like with tourists from everywhere and people coming off the ski slopes. He said it was like two pot-smoking hippies who didn't know how to put a business plan together. (laughs) He said, but now look at them, you know, so it was, interesting to me that this idea of, oh, I know what a good business is, and I don't know, I I don't think you are, and I think you are, you know, he admitted he had no idea, and that it was more about rolling the dice repeatedly, because each business that makes it pays into the tax base again, and then they would take that money to see the next round of businesses, and they were creating middle-class housing, 
very specifically focused on middle class housing because that's where you get the most consumers and you have the most um, you know, people going to jobs, needing jobs, kids going to the schools. So you have a lot of participation in a middle class. I live in a community here in Vermont that has no meat in the sandwich. It's like bread. We have very wealthy, we have very poor, and then there's really no room for the middle class. And like this town figured it out. And so I really think that if we can look at the success stories, we can start to figure out like how to heal our communities. Um, this particular economic development director, I hate to rave so much about it, but it was so impressive. They had actually focused on creating a downtown with an amphitheater and bike paths, and they purified the river, and they, they made it so that all traffic was being driven downtown on a regular basis, and they were putting on events regularly, so there was constant engagement, and the housing they were building was emanating out from downtown, so it was like if you can figure like there's this core, they were like growing it out from there. Um, and so it just was only becoming a bigger point of thriving. Um, and they were making it very walkable, very bikeable, um, which is like what we'd all love in our towns. Yeah. It's so fascinating to hear how um, they make a specific decision to go and help small businesses. And then that ends up leading to um, kind of value creation. Right, and value creation can yeah. be measured in many different ways, from economic to just kind of quality of life, Gini coefficient, all this stuff. But that one decision um, seems to have kind of a ripple impact across the, uh, the the entire local economy, right? Yeah, and they were really big on doing private public partnerships, as we know. Those are they started being so successful that people would come to them as soon as they announced working on something because they knew that oh, they're so good at this now, like we'll be associated with a success story, even if we only contribute a little bit. So at that point, they'd become a magnet for people who wanted to be a part of this story because they'd want to, you know, if you're part of a success story, there's one more thing you can brag about. Um, so at a certain point, the town was kind of creating prestige markers in what it was doing. And uh, I just, I always talk about how you can model prosperity. People think it's not possible. It is absolutely possible. And you don't have to start with that much, but you do have to believe. That was that was sort of what I learned from Ogden. Is it possible to take that model and extrapolate it out, implement it nationally? Or is it only possible in kind of a local economy, in your opinion? I think it starts with the local piece because each economy has certain things it can offer. Like, um, I live in Brattleboro, Vermont right now, especially with the pandemic going on. Um, and, you know, we have rivers, we have ski slopes nearby. We have a beautiful downtown that everyone's very precious about, like no chain stores are allowed. It's all these, you know, mom and pop shops. And, you know, there's all this really nice, um, there's a beautiful arts community. There's pretty much every kind of, you know, musician. We have a circus school that's part of Cirque du Soleil here. Like, it's a pretty wild place for the arts. Um, so each town has, like, kind of what it offers. And you want to lean into, like, what do you offer? The great outdoors? Do you offer the arts? Do you offer, you know, if you're over on the West Coast, maybe it's a tech um, appeal that you can create. But um I think it starts with local, but then you can start knitting those things together, right? Like he, one of the things I found brilliant about this model over in Ogden was they started looking at what neighboring communities were doing so that they could augment what they were doing, but also start pulling in like and knitting together what they were doing with these other communities, um, especially by the way, with the poor. Um, anybody who was impoverished, they didn't want, one of the, things you struggle with when you're dealing with impoverished parts of your community is if you give too much, then you become a magnet and everybody comes to you. So what they were doing was creating kind of um, the compacts with the neighboring communities. Like we'll offer this if you offer that. And that way, like we have a distribution of assistance for people. So it's not like only one, it's not like elephants all getting into a rowboat. So that one town sinks. And so a lot of the modeling is really important when it comes to, you know, you, you can extend it, obviously, nationally, but I think everybody has to be on board with a certain amount of sharing, a certain amount of collaboration to do it. Yeah, no, it, it is. Um, it's one of these things where when you see it work in a small community, you want to 
try to bring it nationally, right? But maybe the magic yeah. is that it, it works in a small community. Uh, another topic that uh, you really care deeply about, and um, I think you're actually working on another book, is uh, around child abuse. Uh, maybe tell us a little bit kind of where did, uh, did, did your interest and intrigue in, in that topic uh, come from and then kind of some of the work that you've done there? Yeah, so while I was working, I, it sounds like I'm involved in a lot of really odd things, right? I mean, if I was watching this for the first time, I'd be like, wait a minute. So she covers oil, the Bitcoin, and then wealth inequality, and oh, child abuse. You know, it just seems pretty random. You just were going to line those up on a board. Um, but each one kind of is iterative. Uh, while I was working in finance, and I was covering um, Wall Street and also when I was living in London, England, writing about finance over there, a lot of, a lot about hedge funds. One of my hedge funds, um, actually Danny Masters hedge fund went to this island uh, called Jersey, which is off the coast of France. And I was already researching Jersey when he moved there, but I just found it interesting that hedge funds were increasingly going over there. And uh, I, was vacationing sometimes in Jersey to see friends. Um, Jersey is the old Jersey to New Jersey. We won't get into the history and everything, but it is a pretty amazing history. Um, uh, it is where Jersey cows come from, Jersey potatoes, when you hear about Jersey cream. It's all from this tiny island off the coast of France. It's about, it's about 12 miles off the coast of France. And it's a peculiar possession of the British crown. And when they were making, uh, when they were creating the European Union, they basically created a carve out that included this island as a tax shelter. So it doesn't really have to follow the EU rules. And for a long time, it became this kind of prime place for the British to shelter their money and people in the Middle East and has a pretty big European following as well. Um, and the island really became this very powerful place with about $2 trillion of tax shelter money, even though it's a tiny island. So I became very interested in this place. And I, I constantly heard rumors when I was visiting the island about the Masons on the island and the church. And, these, you know, everyone would talk about it like there were these cabals. And I just had never really heard anything quite like that. I grew up in the Boston area, right? We all know about the scandals of the church. But it never had a cabal-like feeling the way I was getting from the island when I'd go there. It was very hush-hush. You know, in Boston growing up, like the church scandals were pretty wide open. Everybody knew they were happening. But on the island of Jersey, like people would whisper and sometimes they wouldn't want to talk about it if we were in public. Like they'd be like, I'll tell you more, but we have to meet at the hotel or, you know, and I just thought for such a small community, for so many secrets to be abounding that uh, it would, it, it, it intrigued me. Um, and so I started looking more into it after the asylum, after the asylum. During the time that I was on my desk writing the asylum, there was a very big scandal on the island involving one of the children's homes, which we would consider an orphanage. Um, in the UK, that's not a word they like to use. Um, has a lot of negative connotations that so they call the children's home. And they did a dig under an abandoned children's home that closed in the 80s. There had been all these horrible stories about what had happened there powerful people on the island involved um, and they had found children's remains and then all of a sudden the police officers were being harassed, targeted, threatened. The head of police was suspended like over and over again by the island's authorities even though it wasn't clear why they were suspending him. They'd always come up with like a weird reason like like oh he spent too much on the investigation or, you know, but they told him to like leave no stone unturned. So the whole thing was strange and watching it from the US, I was like, this is bad. You know, like, this is, I've never seen police officers not allowed to investigate like this before. Um, even as a global journalist, you don't usually see that. Um, except in, you know, maybe in Africa sometimes or, but not in like a Western democracy, right? So I was, confused and, and packed my stuff and went over there for the summer to investigate. And all I found was like more and more and more. It was like a bottomless pit of just bad things. And I thought, oh God, I'm not going to be able to finish this over the summer. So I continued working on it when I came back to the States. Um, and I kept traveling back and forth very quietly 
and eventually um, I was interrogated um, by the British authorities. They actually tried to block me from visiting the island and reporting, and they locked me up in the basement of Heathrow when I was traveling, um, interrogated me, and then tried to ban me from the country for two years. Um, the ban was overturned because it wasn't legal, but um, I received, that was the first time I'd received horrible threats. This was pre-Bitcoin. Um, and I would say that out of everything I've been through in my career, this was the hardest because, you know, when someone locks you up, it's pretty scary. Um, if they haven't told you why, you know, I wasn't being arrested. I just was put in a room and the door was shut and I wasn't able to contact anybody for about a day. Um, so that is the next project I'm working on. Um, what happened on this island, the people involved, how bad it was. Um, this is still a thriving tax shelter. Um, and it's still a place where every single bank you can possibly name has an office. Like every single bank, A to Z, has an office in Jersey because it's where you can do really amazing deals um, offshore um, and outside of regulation. And so uh, the work that you've done um, literally has spanned years on this and uh, you're writing a book about it is the, yeah. uh, is kind of the, uh, we know the topic, but is like the angle of the book fleshed out yet or not, or are you still working on that? So the hardest thing, right? Uh, the, the, the hardest thing in the world is to talk about abuse of this level. And, and, you know, we use the word abuse very generically, you know, it's not a, it shouldn't be a generic term because what happened to the children on this island was like, I recall it up there with the crimes described in the Holocaust, like that level of psychological horror, um, physical, you know, horror and, and just, you know, pitting brothers and sisters against each other and small children who were best friends and didn't have parents and against each other. It was very, very sad. Um, and, you know, it's clear children died. Um, the island certainly is not comfortable acknowledging that, but it's very obvious that they did. And the, the home only closed in the late 80s, right? So a lot of people are still alive to talk about it. And the home itself was occupied by the Nazis as a signal station during World War II. Um, the, the island has a very rich history of, you know, very serious situations like the Nazi occupation. Um, so the people on the island are you know, they are still recovering from what I would call like a legacy of some very scary experiences that are in, in addition to the abuse that took place with these children. So a lot of it's about uh, the background of the book definitely involves the history, but um, I really had to open my heart to this island in order to understand it better. So at this point, I feel very attached to the people and to the place and to tell a compassionate story about how this happened, going back to our earlier discussion on how does corruption happen? How do people do horrible things? And maybe most importantly, how do people who, who don't want horrible things to happen end up being silenced, right? How do people end up silenced who would never want this to take place, um, end up enabling it instead, which is sadly, you know, you can classify that pretty high up next to the crimes themselves. So I'm fascinated by this idea of how democracy can break down and we're watching it right now in our own country. You know, a lot of the people on the islands talk about what's happening in our country and uh, say, you know, look at what's going on with you, you know, and, and what can I say? You know, it, we're all susceptible to breakdowns of our system, um, breakdowns of democracy. And we're sort of now living in this post-truth world where the big question is, is how do we define truth? How do we define facts? How do we report these things? So this book seeks to really root everything in concrete facts, but to also explore what happens when story can become so convoluted and so, so subject to debate, um, what can take place. And in the case of this island, the police were not able to finish their investigation. And the islands filled in the basement where they found the remains with cement before anyone else could look. Makes it hard to uh, to get some facts then. Um, it does make it hard. Yeah. yeah. When it, when will the uh, the book come out? Um, hopefully in a year or so. Um, this year is a big writing year. Um, with the pandemic, most writers will tell you it's a great year to do writing. Um, but because I can't travel to the island very much because of all the 
you know, as uh, the U.S. is now being treated like a leper colony uh, by the rest of the world. So traveling is tricky. So I'm hoping all the writing will be done this year, fingers crossed. Very cool. And, and yeah. before I, I move to uh, to kind of wrap up, um, where can people find you uh, on the internet or find uh, some of the past work that you've done either um, for uh, for media organizations or the books? Well, right now I'm redoing my website. So the best place to find me is just on Twitter, which is at truth eater underscore. Well, it's truth underscore eater. Um, and uh, so go to truth underscore eater uh, on Twitter. You can find me there or just type my name, Leah McGrath Goodman. Um, my email and my contact information is kind of all over the internet now. So you can also email me and um, LinkedIn works too, um, all the usual places. But uh, yeah, and I do have a book coming out in November. That's an auto, uh, it's, it's, it's really not related to the corruption investigations I do, but it's a biography of Ariana Huffington from the Huffington Post. And that was just sort of a fun project to do while I do some of these more serious projects. But it's it's a good summer read and uh, that'll be coming out in November in the US. Can people pre-order that yet? Yeah, you can go to Amazon and pre-order. Amazon and uh, just search uh, Ariana Huffington, I'm assuming. Um, Ariana Huffington and probably my name because she has so many books. <laughs> get so many books yourself yeah all right and then my last question before we get into the rapid fire is where did the twitter name truth eater come from what is going on with that oh my gosh i don't know i think it was just whimsical at the time i you know i didn't really know what twitter was going to become so i people will tell you you know it, it's odd because when we talk about the bitcoin investigation and the bitcoin project that was, I think everyone has a moment in their lives that's like a moment of, of truth where their identity and how people see them can end up in this like very difficult standoff. And people who know me personally know that I'm not only obsessed with truth, but I'm kind of that, that asshole, like who, you know, cool state of a friend's like, but you are addicted to drugs though. <laughs> no, or, you know, it, you know, I say it out of love, but it is true. You know, that sort of thing. So um, I'm very much like, you know, stay truth with compassion, but don't not stay truth. Don't be part of that silent majority. Always say what you're certain of and be open to changing facts um, because um, you might have facts, but there might be new facts that put old facts into a new context. So I'm kind of a stickler about all that. And maybe that's where truth theater came from. I can't even remember. But, you know, whenever you're confronted with anyone who thinks you don't care about X, you know, for me, that's deeply personally heartbreaking um, because I'm just that horrible person who, even when it's convenient and in my best interest to ignore facts, like I will cleave to them. And I often get into trouble because of it. <laughs> but um, but I, I can't help myself. Like, I feel like that's my religion. I, I'm not a religious person, but I, I might be a little spiritual, but I definitely have a fact-based, truth-based religion for myself. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I asked the same, I asked the same two questions, uh, to wrap up and then you're going to get to ask me one to, uh, to finish. Uh, the first is what is the most important book that you've ever read? The most important book. Oh my God. That's brutal. I didn't know about these questions. Oh, that's so tough. Can I do question number two first? Sure. Uh, it's more <laughs> fun. Um, aliens, believer or non-believer? Total believer. Why? Um, in fact, I'm reading a book that a journalist wrote on UFOs and all the government research where she did like all the, you know, retired colonels and all that stuff. Oh, because it's so self-centered for us to think that there's nothing out there. I mean, how can we possibly think that? I mean... What, I was talking to a trader over lunch the other day and he's, he's extremely brilliant when it comes to money, but he's kind of not very widely philosophical. Right. And he said, he said, I was watching Nova or, you know, one of those old PBS shows. He's like, and they said that there could be an end to the universe, but there also might not be an end. It might just go on forever. <laughs> and his eyes just were like as big as dinner plates. And I was like, yeah, no, I know. I mean, didn't you do it out in the second grade when you asked your dad? And and he was like, no. He's like, it's terrifying because neither makes sense. If it ends, then what is it, a wall? Or and he's like, and if it doesn't end, and then he just kind of stared off into the distance. 
<laughs> I just thought it's true, right? I mean, like neither answer is very satisfying. Um, but we have to believe that there's so much more than ourselves. I just don't think probabilistically it's possible that there isn't. Um, but you were saying UFOs or aliens. Uh, well, so that's the the big debate, right? Is uh, when I ask the question, some people say, "Well, you know, if the UFOs lead me to believe that aliens are real." Some people say the UFOs are completely different than aliens. Everyone's got their own kind of different analysis, which is why uh, I enjoy asking the question. Yeah, I think I want to answer to aliens in this case because a UFO can just be a satellite that you got wrong, right? <laughs> like, um, and as far as the most important book, oh, that is so hard. Um, I might have to go with um, a book that I recently reread that I just think everyone should read and is so fabulous. It's called The Executioner's Song. Um, what is that and about? It's written, it, it, it was written in a very journalistic style, um, Norman Mailer. And um, it's, about, um, it's about a man who uh, had killed, um, was, he was a criminal and he ended up being almost like a national phenomenon. He he murdered um, and ended up in jail, but might have done some of the best PR campaigns before there were ever real modern day PR campaigns. Um, the Nike, the Nike, uh, just do it comes from him. Right before he was executed, he was like, "Let's do this," or whatever. And Nike ended up adopting it much later as "Just Do It," but. Um, it's just such an interesting story. It goes so deep and I love anything that's journalistic and goes really deep into people's lives. Um, so it's called the Executioner's Song. Highly recommend it. You'll totally get swallowed whole by it. Um, it's a big book. So people are afraid of big books, but I'm assuming most of your, um, most of your people are, you know, fic uh, nonfiction lovers. I'm, I'm also a fiction lover, but a lot of people on Wall Street are and tech are nonfiction lovers. So the executioner's song is something I highly recommend. They'll they'll read anything. They're uh, <laughs> uh, last last night I uh, I tweeted a photo of uh, the Dow of Capital, uh, Mark Spitznagel, and uh, a bunch of people were like, oh, I, I went and bought it right now. So I think that at this point I could uh, yeah. may, maybe tweet even like a, a Barney book or something, and they may go get it. Um, all right. There's, yeah, there's wait. I have to give you one more before I okay. I'm being greedy. Um, Probably my very favorite is called The Birth of the Modern. And I believe it's by a man named Paul Johnson. It's called The Birth of the Modern. And it is all about the laying of the foundations of modern society. And it spans everything from science to art to music. And it's it basically is this 15-year span between 1815 and 1830 when you might be an astronomer and a composer and, you know, a banker, right? You know, when people, these Renaissance men that did everything, um, but it also gets into like the road building and the bridge building and how many people died while building skyscrapers. And it's just so fascinating. Um, it goes really deep. You'll end up buying a bunch of other books while you read it because it goes so deep into different people's lives. Um, it's like a Rosetta Stone for what is today's modern world, but goes, it starts really in the 1800s and I mean, it talks about the founding of this country in the most graphic terms, heartbreaking terms. And you realize that we were just insanely violent. You know, uh, the stuff we don't learn in history class, just how violent we were. And I, I remember reading about Andrew Jackson in this book and how he slaughtered New Orleans. All these Native Americans didn't really have permission from the U.S. government, but just went ahead and did it. And one baby lived and he adopted that little boy into his own family and raised his son. Um, but I mean, the stories were just amazing and unknown to me and um, really strongly recommend The Birth of the Modern. Probably my favorite, most important book. That's a great suggestion. Uh, yeah. You could ask me one question to finish up. What, uh, what one question do you have? Oh, I want to hear your favorite book. Favorite? Um, I don't just have one. Uh, I would. Say, <laughs> oh my god, you're trying to make us have one? <laughs> yeah, most people actually end up giving me more than one. Um, so, uh, books that I think are important. Um, I kind of put them in categories. So, like, 
finance wise, I always, and people who listen have heard me say this a million times, uh, there's three books that I read when I was like 20, 21 years old that were very impactful. So Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, Rich Man in Babylon and Think and Grow Rich. And I literally read them like sequentially right at a formative time. So like that was um, always kind of top of mind. Um, what, uh, Jared Diamond's uh, Gun Sherms and Steel is, you know, sounds very similar to like the birth of the modern, um, kind of the, the yeah. history of the world and the humans, uh, which I think is really interesting. Uh, I really liked um, when is it uh, when breath becomes air? I think right it is, uh, yeah. is a good one. Uh, the Dow of Capital is a good one, um, and then let's see, maybe one more. Wow! Uh, I, you know what book I actually really enjoyed that um, that y- you would probably be familiar with is uh, the book that uh, Steve Schwartzman wrote uh, recently. Uh, Whatever it takes. I haven't read it yet. Did oh, you read it? Good. Yeah, it's very good. Um, so I mean, I've read. Really? Was it? You're like, is he a writer? Maybe I'm sure. I, so I don't know who wrote it, but it's <laughs> but it's definitely uh, it's cool because I think it it has the perfect balance between being entertaining, uh, being informative in terms of like here's what we did, and mm-hmm. also uh, sharing like the mindset and perspective and, and kind of all of that. So some of these books are like, you know, if you read. Um, I don't know, like, like a lot of the executive type books are just basically PR pitches, but like, if I had to think, so Schwartzman's book was good. Ken Langone's book was good. Uh, Sam yeah. Zell's book was good. Ted Turner's book was good. Like there's a couple of them that kind of are informative, entertaining, and also share that perspective. Um, so when I find those, like they're, they're pretty rare and, uh, I'll try to, uh, to share them with folks, but yeah. Cause you're, if you're an extraordinary person, like hopefully your book is Somewhat extraordinary at the very, <laughs> very least. Well, it's also like, um, you know, take Schwarzman. Like he's built such a massive business and been doing it for so long. Um, so it's funny to kind of see uh, the stories that he remembers. Like he tells a story in the book of um, they open up uh, Blackstone. They run a big ad in the uh, paper. Nobody calls. Uh, they're like moving into a new office on like Park Avenue or something, and every, and you know they're like expecting everyone on Wall Street to come and and uh, do business with them. Nobody shows up. Uh, they get a knock on the door, and there's a guy uh, in a motorcycle jacket. And you know Steve's like, "Are you like the food delivery dude? Like, what, what are you doing here?" And uh, the guy's like, "Oh, my sister said she worked with you at your last company and told me to come see you." And so the, uh, he invites the guy in who's literally got his motorcycle chained up outside uh, and they sit on the floor because there's no furniture yet. And uh, they just talk about investing. And it turns out that guy is Sam Zell, who they end up doing all these deals with. And then he later buys the, the big REIT from him. And so oh it's like, you, you hear that story and you're just like, man, you've done a lot of deals. You've done a lot of things in your life. But you remember sitting on the floor with Sam Zell when you first opened you know, Blackstone and like it was important enough for you to put in the book. Right. So I think that's like kind of the interesting stuff that uh, just like what makes it in the book versus what doesn't. Um, and so he's yeah. got stories like that when he met Jack Welsh at dinner, when Jack Welsh was like a associate somewhere or something, you know, and he's just like, yeah. And then like Jack Welsh became Jack Welsh. But I just was friends with him when he was just, you know, Jack. <laughs> You're like, wow. Okay. <laughs> it's a really small world. I mean, it's amazing how. It's it's amazing how one project I do has some link with somebody I didn't expect. And, you know, it really is a small world, especially when it comes to people um, circulating in the money tech circles. It's very small. Um, And it's just, it's really funny when you mentioned Blackstone, I I just remembered, I did a story in the journal about Blackstone doing some deal. And the night editor, after I passed it in, you know, when you do a spell check and you hit ignore through the spell check, they hit change through the entire spell check. And so blood, Blackstone was turned into Bloodstone for the entire story and went into print in the Wall Street Journal as Bloodstone. And there was somebody named in the story who had done the deal and his last name was like an R last name, but somehow, it, you know how the Wall Street Journal would use these honorifics like Mr. So-and-so, you know, they'd use the last name, but with a Mr. Yes. in front of it. Somehow the R last name had been turned into Raccoon. And so throughout the story, it was like, Mr. Raccoon said, you know, like the whole thing was a mess and it went to print. And you can imagine, like, Blackstone calls me in the morning, and they're like, what is this? <laughs> and they, they didn't even know what to say, because they, they were like, we want a correction, but we don't even know what to do, because it's such a mess. 
because <laughs> somebody had changed all these words. And uh, in the end, we all just kind of laughed. Like they were angry and then we all just had to laugh. And and somebody called me back from Blackstone on a stone and said, they were like, I think Bloodstone might even be a better name. <laughs> <laughs> well, the people competing with them probably think so for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, thank you so much. This was very enjoyable. And uh, I, I want to urge people, um, we're almost at limit, but I want to urge people, um, if they do have real questions or things they want to share um, about anything that I'm working on, whether it's the child abuse investigation on the, on the island of Jersey, whether it's um, Bitcoin, whether it's their thoughts or um, information that they think would be helpful, or wealth inequality, um, oil market, any of those things. Um, uh, anything related to trading and money and tech, I'm always very interested. And um, I, you know, I really appreciate having the time to chat with you. Absolutely. Listen, you did a fantastic job. Thank you so much for uh, for taking the time to do this and we'll have to do it again in the future. Great. I'll talk to you soon. Take care.